back to the channel, everybody. Uh, I'm Max, as you guys probably know by now. Um, doing a little bit of a new segment here um, on the channel. We're going to be doing some uh, previewing of next year's opponents for the Ducks. Um, I'm joined by Jacob Archer, uh, who is also a fellow Scoop Duck writer with me. And, uh, you know, Jacob was uh, covering the Ducks, uh, kind of the Scoop Duck beat writer last year, got to go to the Pac-12 games. So he definitely knows his stuff. He got to see it in person. Jacob, how's it going, man? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's going good. Thanks for having me. Excited to do this. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, no, you're, Sorry, you're, that was you're, bad. No, that you're you're bad. totally cool, man. Don't worry about it. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but Jacob's got the fresh Scoop Duck merch. I need to I need <laughs> to get myself some of that. Um, but yeah, so kind of what we were thinking to start, uh, we were going to talk about the Ducks versus Huskies game that went down last year in Seattle. So Jacob, uh, what what were your thoughts and maybe some takeaways from the matchup last year and the the heated rivalry? Yeah, I mean that game showed a lot. Um, especially, you know, Mario traveling up there, first time up there playing up north at the stadium. And I thought it showed a lot because it was kind of a – it was a really weird game. I mean, especially early, you know. Easton had that huge touchdown right down the middle of the field, that, like, 50, 60-yarder. And it was like, oh, man. Like, I went in to the game, I, and I was like, I thought Oregon had the edge at a lot of different positions and stuff. And especially the first couple quarters, it was like, I don't know, you know, if – if they have enough at a lot of these positions and then slowly but surely you kind of saw it turn around and, and the run game started getting better. I think the offensive line, I think it took a, a couple quarters or whatnot, and then it really started to click and you saw, you know, Cyrus get all those big runs and multiple other backs start to kind of, to kind of pick up those chunk plays and, and stuff like that. And then the passing game as well, the passing game got going, um, especially, you know, you can pin that play on that, that Micah Pittman screenplay, for example, like those kind of easy, easy routes that were just easy plays, stuff like that, that can create a lot of yards. And those started to work and they hadn't been doing a lot of those at the start of the game. Um, so I thought it was, it was a, it was great to kind of see the growth of the team, even in that one game, uh, just kind of having to overcome adversity, being on the road, pretty hostile environment. Of course, you know, they never, Oregon fans are never going to get treated too well up there, but it was, uh, it showed a lot out of the team. And, and I think it kind of, kind of the turning point of the season, even though it was a great season all along, that was kind of the game where you saw a lot out of a lot of different positions. You're like, okay, this team could really start to, to, to piece it together. And you can kind of see just how good that team was going to be. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you made a lot of awesome points. Um, I remember when I was watching it, I was hoping, you know, like every Oregon fan is like, okay, like, we got our bearings, like, let's take over the game and, you know, maybe even run away with it. But as we all know, um, with, you know, more parity coming in the Pac-12, not every game is necessarily going to be like that. Um, Mario isn't necessarily the kind of coach who's going to, you know, take that Chip Kelly approach, like, let's run up a bunch of points. But I think, like you were saying, it, it did – I think it was a big stepping stone type of game for this program. Um, a major, major game for Cristobal in his first, uh, I think it was his first full season as head coach. I really should know that, but I think it was his first full season. I might be wrong on that. Um, but yeah, traveling to uh, Seattle, fans are super loud there. I don't like the Huskies, but you know, we're, we got to give him credit there. And uh, yeah, just sealing the game at the end. I mean, great, great, um, you know, win for the program and a full, a pretty complete game. Yeah, totally. And it was a, it's a, it was the second year. Second, okay, okay. The My first bad. year was the the Red Box Bowl, Michigan State season. And technically, okay. he coached the Vegas Bowl before that, but we don't have to count that game because that game was doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that yeah, just continue off what you were saying. It 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 was a huge win for Cristobal and the program. It gave him a lot of validation. I think even if washington wasn't the best team last year and you know some things went wrong finishing seven and five stuff like that in the regular season but it's still a big win it's it's a it's a rivalry against a good not great team on the road those games are never easy in the pac-12 no matter who you're playing even if even if they're not the best team i mean that's that's their biggest game of the year last year was that game they were probably hoping to knock us off and if they if they beat oregon that it was fine you know uh there's the season was fine so it was it was a a, a very big program win and, and another notch on the belt for crystal balls. He's been adding a lot of those last couple seasons already. 
definitely, definitely. I mean, it's cool to – you see you and I both, maybe me a little more than you because of recruiting, uh, we see the battle on the recruiting trail between these two teams. Um, you know, big prospects in Washington uh, are now having to decide between Oregon and Washington. So we see that battle on the recruiting trail, which it seems like Oregon is winning more often than not lately, which is awesome. Um, and then to see that, you know, transpire on the field and the Ducks can, you know, put, put their foot down and get that big win. Yeah, and I mean, you saw a lot of crystal ball recruits make plays in that game. You know, you saw you saw Pittman with the screen touchdown. You saw Sewell have a fantastic game. You know, the, tons of other guys. Kayvon was getting involved off the edge. Guys like that that are, you know, they're guys that are early in their career, yes, but they're they're players that crystal ball brought in, not not players left over from you know the other teams. Uh, from the other coaches in those eras and stuff. So it, it was great to see those guys be big contributors already. And guys that, I mean, Micah Pittman, that was a huge UW-Oregon battle that year for him. UW was involved pretty late in his recruitment. So seeing guys like that already start to pay off, and, and now you're seeing the on-field results as well, which, because we all know how great Crystal Ball's been as a recruiter, and it's it's even better to actually see those results on the field with those players. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I wanted to just stay on that for a quick second. Um, you know, seeing Cristobal bring these guys in and seeing them contribute early, I think that is one of the big, big signs that this program is headed in the right direction. Um, you can bring in great recruits, but obviously you're going to benefit more the sooner that you can get them on the field. But to be specific, you don't want them to get, like, thrown on the field like they were in 2016 when they're like, hey, you, you're you what we have, as opposed to you're young and you're better than what we have and you're, like, established. So that was awesome to see, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, talking about 2016, you look at that team that year. Do you know who led the team in interceptions that year? Here's a fun trivia. Do you know who was the team leader in interceptions? Schooler? Yeah, it was Schooler. And then the next year we see him at receiver. So it's like you want to talk about players getting thrown out too quick. The starting safety the next season wasn't even at that position anymore. So – yeah. It's, it's definitely – you're exactly right what you're talking about. Of You want to see them on the field, but only when they're ready. And then you get those guys on the field, and then they're just pushing the upperclassmen. And then those kids become upperclassmen, and then they're getting pushed by the next wave of recruits. I mean, that's how you build a successful program is just competition at, at, at every position, regardless of how old you are, what season you're in, how good you were the last year. It's just – it's always that will to get better. And I think it's a hard line of balance, too, as a coach. I think it can go well if you do it right, but I also think it can collapse in on you, as we've kind of seen at some of these other big-time programs that recruit well that don't always necessarily have that on-field success that we've seen Oregon had, especially this last season. Um, so I think he's done a great job, and that's just building the culture. I mean, you know, he, he's done a great job at coming in, and it's a night and day difference from how it was five years ago in this program. But obviously it's been working because you're seeing all the success and the recruiting success and on-field success and, and stuff like that, which is – it's just been – it's been fantastic to watch. And it was a maybe a quicker turnaround than I even expected when Crystal Ball first got hired. I thought he was a good hire at the time, and I thought it was going to be the right long-term move. But just how quickly everything has changed where, you know, year two, you're already winning the Rose Bowl 12-2. and two, You're one loss away from maybe being in playoff contention, and that's just – so much more than I thought two years ago when that hire Definitely. happened. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, um, that's a, a little bit of reflection slash evaluation on the Ducks and the Huskies last year. want to shift gears now a little bit um, since we are, you know, kind of previewing the, the Huskies for next year, a uh, big opponent for the Ducks. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, maybe some storylines that caught your eye and kind of what team you're envisioning the Huskies fielding for 2020? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest question mark is just offensive identity. What are they going to be? It's a new offensive coordinator. There's going to be new receivers. You lose Hunter Bryant, the big tight end to the draft. You know, you lose your top running back to the NFL as well. You bring in a new offensive coordinator. Um, just a lot of new moving pieces. And, of course, Easton's gone. Now you have a quarterback competition and a new head coach, and it's like, okay, what's our offense going to be? And that's going to be my biggest when, when watching the Huskies, especially early next year. What are the Huskies' offense going to be? It, I still think it's going to be a pretty run-heavy offense, um, especially with that defense. And you have Jimmy Lake as the head coach now, who is a defensive-minded coach. So he's probably thinking, let's win through our defense and let our offense just be good enough to, to win the game. 
Um, but I mean, it's going to be, it's, it's going to look different than last year for sure. Obviously you just too many different pieces, moving pieces and, and a new offensive coordinator who it's, it'll be interesting to see how much Jimmy Lake kind of hands the reins over to him or if he thinks, you know, if Lake thinks he should have a big say in the offense, or if he truly says, you know, I made this hire, this experienced hire, I'm a defensive minded coach. I'm going to hand over basically everything to the offense. Maybe I'll have a little bit of say, but most part it's his. Um, and, and I mean, other than offensive identity, it's just going to be who's the quarterback. Cause that's what everyone wants to know is who's going to be the quarterback. And I mean, right now I'd have my money on Jacob Sermon. Um, I think he, he, he has the most experience in that room, but he's only thrown three passes in college still. So not a lot of experience necessarily, but he's been in the program now for a while. Um, and he's, he's, he's good. And I think he would be a pretty good player. He's, he's six, five, two thirty four. He's a big dude. Just kind of like we saw Eason last year, just a, a big body. He can throw the ball downfield really far. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily translate to, to on-field success always. So I definitely think the just the quarterback and, and kind of, what the Huskies offense will look like is going to be what I'm watching for next year. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it seems like um, that's going to be one of the storylines, you know, how is Jimmy Lake going to manage the offense? You do have those coaches that are out there like, Hey, I want all the control versus some like, you know, kind of delegate and uh, kind of a little bit more of a hands-off approach. So I think the quarterback situation will be interesting. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts uh, during the off season and some people have drawn some uh, comparisons with uh, Oregon and Washington. They're both going to be breaking in new quarterbacks. Um, I think Oregon probably has a little bit better of a situation just because they're bringing a lot of their main offensive weapons back. Sure, they do lose a lot of their offensive linemen, but you do have the most important one returning in Panay Sewell, and you have an absolutely stacked offensive line room to choose from, whether it be uh, you know, Jonah, Jonah T., or um, Stephen Jones, you know, they'll, they'll have options. Um, but as far as the, the Huskies go, um, I, I'm right there with you. I think um, it will be interesting to see what they do at quarterback. They're going to be a team rooted in their defensive identity. Um, obviously, you wouldn't expect anything different with a DC. Um, they do have a running back that comes back. You mentioned uh, Richard Newton, I think. Um, and one of your pieces had about 500 yards of, off, of uh, rushing, rather. So... I'm interested to see what they look like as far as their projection next year. Um, do you think that this is a team that the Ducks could beat? Do you envision it being a close game? What are your thoughts on the the next matchup when the Huskies come to Eugene? Yeah. And I mean, there's so many unknowns still in this matchup. Like who's going to be a quarterback for both teams? What are the offenses going to look like? Stuff like that. So it, it's it's hard necessarily to say, oh, I think they're this many points better. But just looking on paper, I think they're quite a bit better. Um, I know they're breaking in four new offensive linemen, Oregon is. But if that's that's the only position, that's the one position on the field you almost don't even have to worry about with Cristobal. Because it might be four new players, new starters, but you know that they've been getting trained by one of the best offensive line coaches in football. Um, so, you know, you can expect a certain level of success out of them, even if they haven't necessarily stepped on the field. And a lot of these guys have seen snaps like Steven Jones and guys like that, that we've seen already be really, really successful on the field. And now they're just stepping into bigger roles. Um, and the only other big part that I think gives Oregon an advantage is the offensive coordinator. And I know it's, you never know how guys are going to fare when they move job to job. Like we saw Oregon's new offensive coordinator, Moorhead, have wild success at Penn State, leave for Mississippi State as the head coach, doesn't quite work out, gets fired, comes to Oregon. The, the main reason I bring this up is because I thought the John Donovan hire was a reach and it wasn't necessarily the best hire. Now, I don't know anything about that situation. You know, maybe he is great. And maybe his on-field results when he was offensive coordinator weren't totally indicative of who he is. But, I mean, you can, you can look, because he was offensive coordinator before Moorhead, and you can just compare even the stats of those two. And it was just wildly more efficient during the Moorhead years versus the, the Donovan years. Um, granted, Moorhead had Saquon. Moorhead had Trace McSorley, guys like that. But you saw a lot more creativity. So I'm just – I'm worried about that the Huskies – won't be necessarily creative enough. I just haven't seen enough from Donovan as an offensive coordinator where I don't necessarily feel comfortable saying, hey, he's coming to a new place, new quarterback, new running back, lots of inexperience. 
you know, he's going to kill it. I just, I don't know if I have that confidence in him. And now I'm not saying it's going to be totally bad and, and it's all going to fall apart, but it just, looking ahead next year there's just so so many question marks on so many parts of the of their offense and then you bring in a question mark offensive coordinator too and it's just like not necessarily a great recipe for success um so i'm i would be fairly confident saying on paper right now i i would say oregon would definitely have the edge but i mean who knows maybe sermon is great you know no nobody knows so we'll, we'll still have to see it on the field and I mean, we'll see it in their week two matchup against Michigan, which I think is going to be really telling of kind of what team they are for this upcoming season. Yeah, yeah, lot, lots of great points there. Um, you mentioned a lot of uncertainty um, surrounding, you know, what kind of offense they're going to put out. And especially with, you know, spring football getting cut short across the country, preparation is one of the biggest things that teams have lost and they're trying to make up for it whether it be through film sessions, Zoom meetings, um, you know, individual on-field workouts that people are doing in their hometowns. Um, on the topic of preparation, um, I think one point that you had that I want to bring up is um, the Huskies week three by week or week four. Whenever it falls, it falls before they come to Eugene. How do you think that might factor in to how they play? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an early bye week, which might be ideal for some teams, depending on if they're banged up or not. Um, but it just gives them an extra week of preparation, like you said. I mean, it's definitely not going to hurt them that they have a bye week and every player can get healthy. My only concern with that early bye week is if things haven't clicked yet. You know, if they come out against Michigan and the offense looks kind of flat, but they, they win week one, week three, because they're, you know, they're playing some opponents that they probably should be able to beat. and maybe it looks fine in that, but against Michigan, it's just like, Oh, what are we doing out here? So if things are clicking and going well, I think it's super beneficial just because it gives them more time to, to prepare and stay healthy. But if things aren't going so well, then you have an extra week just to sit there as the players and the coaches and just, you're trying to figure out what's wrong and you can't pinpoint it on anything or, you know, it's nothing you can fix or change. So I think, I think it could help them. Um, but as far as just you're still breaking a new offensive coordinator, new offensive linemen, you know, lots of new receivers and stuff. And you want to get them as many on field reps as possible to get that, you know, connection between those receivers and quarterback yeah. going tight ends and quarterback going and everything where that, that aspect of it might not help them as much. Um, but I still probably would say it's a benefit for them just because they can get healthy and they can have another week of game planning. Right on, right on. Okay. Um, I guess it just really remains to be seen whether that will help them or hurt them in the end. Um, I've personally kind of been of the thinking maybe halfway, three quarters of the season is kind of more of an ideal time for a, a bye week. So we've talked, we've hit on some big points already. We talked about the Ducks and Huskies last year, um, kind of what the Huskies are looking like this year, um, some big storylines to follow. Um, Kind of to wrap it up a little bit on on Washington. I want to take a look at um, the uh, the schedule and maybe just uh, breeze through some games that you're going to keep your eye on, um, and then maybe ultimately how we see them faring as a season overall. Yeah, um, let me pull up the schedule here. Yeah, for, for sure. Reasons. It's not loading. Uh, so week two is Michigan. Week one is the. Uh, or week one is Michigan. Excuse me. I was wrong on that. So I guess it doesn't count. I got caught up early week one against Michigan. Um, and you know, that game's tough. Cause it's, I definitely, Michigan will be favored in that game. I would think I would New think quarterback for them too. What'd you say? New quarterback for Michigan. Exactly. Too, right? Michigan so Patterson a lot of unknowns, but I know Michigan falls short a lot of years and stuff like that, but they're still a, a great, football team I mean they're never not at least you know eight nine wins especially under Harbaugh and stuff um so it'll be it'll be a new look for both teams it's obviously it's in Seattle which helps them a lot gives them that little bit of an edge but also if there's fans or not in the stadium who knows how much edge that that actually gives I mean the team still has to travel which I think that's even even more so than the noise and stuff it's just that if you have to fly and stay at hotels and stuff, that's kind of the aspect of traveling on the road that I think is a lot harder than necessarily playing in front of 60,000 screaming fans, even if that it does affect it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a lot of the travel stuff. So Michigan will still have to go on the road and stuff, but 
again, just with what I talked about earlier, it's just so many unknowns. I mean, on that offense, especially that game, that could be an ugly low scoring game, a week one it game could, with, yeah, with two new teams and defense is probably more the, the strength of both of those teams. That could be a, a pretty ugly scrappy game, which if it's, if it's ugly like that, all it takes is a player or two for a team to win. Um, but I would, I would give the edge to Michigan right now. I think I just trust their coaching staff and their system a little bit more, um, especially because we haven't seen Lake and, and Donovan, you know, is still up in the air for how good of a hire it was. So I would, I would, I'm not a huge Michigan fan. I don't necessarily think they're going to make the playoffs this year or anything, but I, I would give them the edge for that week one matchup. Okay. Right on. Um, sorry, you're saying you give Michigan the edge or Michigan. Yeah. Okay, just wanted to just wanted to clarify. Yeah, Michigan. I would I would give Michigan edge that week. Okay, gotcha. I yeah, I, I agree with that one. Uh, I think it'll kind of be a little bit of a toss up. I'm really interested to see how both teams look in that game. Um, moving along here, um, Sacramento State. We probably don't need to talk too much about yeah, that these game. next two games. I mean, Utah State might be a little something, but they don't have Jordan Love anymore, and I Washington should be able to beat them. If if they struggle with that game, then there's a, a, a bigger problem going on. Yeah, in Seattle. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we're saying Michigan probably gets the edge. Sac State, that's a dub. Utah State could be – it won't be a pushover, but I think that most people expect them to win that game. Mm-hmm. We talked about the Ducks the next week. I think we give the Ducks the edge there. Um, as far as how big of an edge, we're not totally sure yet because we're still waiting to see how both teams look offensively with new quarterbacks. Um, Beavs here in the next week – it's pretty sad if you can't win that game. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting game enough, though. I think I think you saw at least a little bit something out of the Jonathan Smith coach Beavers. I'm not saying they're going to win a lot of games or they're even going to win this game, but it would be the kind of game where if you're if you're Jonathan Smith, like man, if you can just compete even in that game and make it look close or anything, I think that would be a, a win in their mind. So I could see the Beavers giving them a little bit of a problem for a couple quarters, but. I think ultimately they'll just be too much bigger, too too strong, too fast for the Beavers to to hang in that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for adding. I feel like sometimes I'm a little blinded and <laughs> just just uh, go go by the Beavers sometimes. Um, so moving along, um, after that we got Utah, and I think Utah is going to be an interesting team to see. Because a lot of people, you know, they had them as a Pac-12 – or not, sorry, Pac-12 – a Pac-12 favorite, yes, but a playoff contender last year. And they really were up until the Pac-12 championship game. Um, so, they're a little – they also are going to be breaking in a new quarterback mm-hmm. um, with um, – shoot, what's his name? Help me out here. Oh, Huntley? Tre- Trevor – yeah, Hunt- Huntley's gone. Yeah. Um, Huntley and Zach Moss, the running back, who's a beast. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was the real deal. So. Yeah, he's legit. It's it's the era of breaking in uh, the season of breaking in new quarterbacks yeah. in the Pac-12. It, it's all about new all quarterbacks. Across, Pac-12. All That's the storyline. <laughs> so, but on the Utes, I think Kyle Whittingham is as good a coach as pretty much anybody, especially when it comes to developing talent. So, I don't know. I think this one um, maybe Utah isn't as bad as people think they might be this next year. What do you see the Huskies and the and the Utes in this matchup? I think both teams are going to be fine next year I don't I would give the edge to Utah in this game being that it's at home and in my eyes Whittingham is a much better head coach especially because we haven't seen anything out of Lake so who knows but he's has a he has a proven track record of doing a lot with a little bit of talent um so I I would give him the edge but if their quarterback is in great you know if things aren't going great I could see the Huskies winning this game but I, I would I would definitely give the edge to Utah right now. Okay, right on. So I think we both agree on that. Utah, um, we're not trying to agree here, people. It's just happening. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we give Utah the edge. And then the next week, they uh, are back at home against an Arizona team that really struggled last year. And I feel like they haven't really found their footing under Kevin Sumlin. Um, so they welcome the Wildcats to Seattle. What do you what do you think about this matchup? It's interesting. I'm I'm pretty out on the the Sumlin led Wildcats. I just haven't really seen anything as far as like recruiting or on field goes that really gives me any like any hope that they're going to finally put it together. I mean, they had Tate and it kind of fell apart. I mean, they have 
they have an experienced quarterback at least now in Grant Gunnell who split a lot of snaps with Tate and he looked he looked fine at times um he definitely struggled with a lot of things but he had some moments I thought that looked good so maybe the offense is fine I just that defense is not a thing of beauty for sure it's it's uh it's pretty rough to say the least at most positions I mean they have a couple good players but as a whole unit it's it's lacking for sure so uh, another game I would say the Huskies should probably comfortably win um, unless things aren't going great for them they should they should be able to beat the 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 Wildcats sorry (laughs) gotcha gotcha yeah no I I think you make a lot of great points Um, it's kind of a a mixed bag at quarterback you have a guy who is experienced but he doesn't maybe have the confidence of the coaching staff from last year, like, hey, you're the guy. So maybe this is the year where they're saying, hey, you are the guy that we're, that's running the, running the ship. Um, so I think that that will probably be a dub for the, the Huskies. The, the Wildcats do have the Schooler brothers with Brendan Schooler transferring to Arizona, get an extra eligibility. I'm keeping my notes here real quick, so I just want to make sure that I'm not over. So let's see how many games that is. Uh, it's one. Seven games. So. So, yeah, we're through seven games, and we've said probably losses to Utah, Oregon, and Michigan. So about Got four that. and three, or give or take, somewhere like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So four and three is what we're looking at the Huskies right now. And then after that, they hit the road and head down to Berkeley. And I think Cal is honestly one of the better teams. They're shaping up to be one of the better teams. Um, in the Pac-12 North and probably across the entire Pac-12, I think they're kind of getting a little bit slept on. Um, and I don't think they're going to be a, a team that we can just walk over in this next year. What do you, what do you think? Yeah. I, I, I go with the Bears winning this one, but what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Not to agree with you for the eighth straight time, but I, I have the same thing. It's a Halloween game. Might be a night game. I know the – the the crowd environment isn't necessarily always a factor at Berkeley because it's not always a huge sellout stadium but just being on the road I the the Bears showed a lot last year I thought and their defense is like it's legit it's a it's the real deal Pac-12 defense it's it's good enough to beat a lot of teams in the Pac-12 and I mean we saw them do that we saw them win some ugly games last year I mean that 20 to 19 rain delay game in 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 Seattle last year was it was brutal and I stayed up to watch that game it was terrible it was uh, it looked terrible (laughs) but they're what about watching (laughs) yeah it was like one in the morning and I'm watching two teams just run the ball for three yards every play and but oh well football's football gotta watch it and Mm -hmm. the the Bears though like their defense is legit and they lose Evan Weaver who was had like 180 tackles or something just insane last year um all got some records for that but they have a they have a legit defense and they do lose some other pieces ashton davis safety went to the nfl guys like that but they've just showed me enough where i think wilcox has that program in the right spot where even though they're losing a couple guys i i think that defense is going to stay pretty good through most of these years and stuff and on the road it's i i would i would think the Bears win but I would also guess this one's probably a pretty ugly game as well and those games can always be coin flips on one play or whatever mm-hmm. um, but I would gi- I'd give the edge to, to Cal right now okay yeah we we uh we're in agreement on that one this could come down to the battle of the Garbers brothers depending on uh who UW ultimately selects as their starter um so moving right along here they uh stay with the Bay Area teams the next week um, as they welcome Stanford from Palo Alto uh, into Washington. Um, this one, uh, I think it'll be an interesting matchup just because Stanford is really in a place that we haven't seen them in a while, um, you know, kind of working from the bottom up. I think uh, David Shaw, say what you will about him. The team wasn't too great last year, but I still think he's a decent coach. Um, they returned Davis Mills at quarterback. Um, and I don't know, I, I might I might be inclined to give Stanford the edge in this one, even though it's in Seattle. Yeah. yeah, this one was tough because I feel like Stanford is another team that's so hard to kind of pinpoint what they're going to be next year. Um, I'm a huge Shaw fan, and I think, I think he's done great things. And I know they've had 
some years that haven't been quite as successful, but they also necessarily can't just go out and recruit a bunch of four and five stars always because of their academic stuff where they can only go after, you know, a very select few of guys typically. Um, but I'm a believer and they're one of those teams that it wouldn't shock me if they were a eight and four, nine and three Pac-12 team, you know, maybe they upset one team and they lose one game they shouldn't, stuff like that. And they're sitting there kind of in the mix of things that we, whatever, 10 or 11 or something like that. But this one's hard because you want to talk about unknowns, which has been a theme of this. Both these teams really, to me, are like both their seasons could go either way. I, I, I could see a scenario where both teams are, are pretty, pretty good. Um, there's also – you lose a couple pieces, and really quickly I think both teams fall apart. Um, so I think this game will be one of those, like, if it, it'll probably be the team, whoever's healthier and, and, and that week specifically, if they're not losing any big pieces, um, I'd probably give the edge to, to UW at home right now, but I'm saying that as the, it's a, it's a very slight, very slight advantage for, for that week, for sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think this could be one of those games, um, that maybe comes down to coaching, um, you know, we're both relatively confident in David Shaw. He's an experienced guy, Jimmy Lake first season. Um, so I think we're a little bit split on that one. I'm going to go ahead and give that one to Stanford, but that that's just my opinion on this one. So some disagreement, it seems like. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe this. Time. We disagreed oh. on something finally. Oh, awesome. No. <laughs> it, it just took a bit. Um, moving along here, um, last three games of the season, we're looking at a trip to Los Angeles to play against the Trojans at the Coliseum. Um, USC has uh, some question marks themselves, but I really feel like this has been a pretty strong off season for them. Uh, they bring in Dante Williams from Oregon. That was a, a big uh, blow to the Ducks coaching staff. He's a, an LA guy and um, they do return Keaton Slovis at quarterback, who was one of the best quarterbacks in the PAC 12. If, Honestly, maybe even in the country, he was putting up some serious yeah. numbers after um, after uh, JT Daniels went down. And I think I'm going to give this one to USC because uh, they're going to be at home, and I think they're just in a better situation. And just even though they don't always show it, they have a ton of talent on their roster, and I think that they might just get a little more out of it this year. Yeah, I would give the Trojans the edge here too. Um, if – if you're Clay Helton and you haven't had all this success necessarily on the field that you have been hoping for, how do you fix it? You bring in great coaches to let them do their jobs and make your team better. And I mean, that's what he did with Dante Williams. I mean, I bet you we see an instant improvement because we know they have talent there. I mean, they have a boatload of talent in the secondary right now, just four stars and five stars galore. Uh, so I think it was a fantastic hire. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to really improve their defense a lot. The, the only thing that's kind of given me hesitation about this game is, so last year with Slovis, who was fantastic, he was so fun to watch, by the way, those SC games, I mean, they just were throwing the ball everywhere all over the field. But they lose some guys on that receiver core. I mean, you lose Michael Pittman and, and some other guys that are big, big-time contributors that a lot of times you see Slovis just kind of chuck it up there to them and, and kind of hope they get a 50-50 ball. So my only, my only I, I do think the Trojans win. My only thing is UW secondary is so strong, I believe, this year. I think they're going to have a really, really strong year and be really good. I mean, they had just have Elijah Molden, Trent McDuffie, safety freshman Cameron Williams, who was a freshman last year, who struggled at times but had some really, really good flashes, I thought, where I think he's going to be their, their full-time starter for the next couple of seasons. And if that secondary is able to kind of slow down that receiving attack and limit them a little bit, and if their defensive line is just good enough to get some pressure on Slovis, I could, I could see their defense creating a turnover too. And if things go right, they could win that game. They'll probably need a couple of things to go right that game for sure. A couple SC mishaps. But I wouldn't say it's impossible for them to win. But as of right now, I would definitely say the Trojans in most areas of the field are, are probably the better team and, and, and will win that game. Okay, gotcha. Last two, um, I, I, all great points. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, and then we have Colorado here, second to last game of the season, uh, right around Thanksgiving. They uh, host them in Seattle. Uh, Colorado loses Stephen Montez, 
um, as well as Mel Tucker, who is now the head coach at Michigan State. I was really surprised to see him bolt so quickly. I was kind of interested to see what he would do with the Buffaloes uh, being an SEC coach and coming in to the Pac-12. So I don't know. I don't really know a ton about Colorado, but I know that they're definitely not on the same recruiting or talent level as USC. So I see this as a much more winnable game for the Huskies. Yeah, I think it's pretty winnable. I think they should. This is one of those games that, okay, Colorado might be a fine team, but if you're, if you're the Huskies and Jimmy Lake, these are the games you have to win. You can't, you can't lose at home to a, a team with a new quarterback, new head coach, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I was surprised too to see Tucker go. I don't know. I, he had slowly convinced me through the season that I thought he was going to be kind of the answer for that team. Not necessarily the answer like, oh, they're going to be in the playoffs in three years. But you could kind of see areas of their team already improving. I thought they were a lot more physical. I thought their recruiting was getting better. I know they landed last year a couple, a couple solid, solid guys out on the West Coast and stuff like that. Um, and then to see him bolt after saying, I'm not going anywhere. And then it was like six hours later, Mel Tucker, head coach, Michigan State. And it was like, out. I mean, that has to hurt to any program as we saw with, I mean, it happened here at Oregon with Taggart basically just saying, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. And then leaving that later that day. Um, and the coach they brought in, I thought it was lackluster. I thought they could have done a lot better. They brought in Carl Doral. If I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing the last name right. Um, he was former UCLA coach back a couple of while back, 10 plus years ago or whatever. And I was kind of looking through him when they hired him and, and kind of seeing his track record. And it was, it was fine. It wasn't bad, but it definitely wasn't like, oh, we lost Mel Tucker. Well, we got this new guy here. It's like, it's a coach who's already been the head coach at places and it's kind of not worked, which I never like teams kind of just recycling. I always think they should try. And they had, they had some guys on staff I thought were deserving. And then the chief's offensive coordinator, I thought they would take a run at whoever, I forget, I'm forgetting his name. He went to Colorado back in the 90s or whatever. But mm. so it, it makes me not as optimistic about the Buffaloes moving forward. And I think they could win a couple games, but I don't, I don't see them as a team that's really in contention or even going to give a lot of those teams problems next year. So I would, I would definitely say the Huskies should, should be able to win that game. All right. So we got a dub over the, the Buffaloes. And then wrapping up this, uh, this episode here of a uh, season preview. In the Pac-12, we have the Cougs of WSU. Uh, UW will head to Pullman for the annual Apple Cup, a game that WSU just really has struggled in in recent years. But they're also breaking in a new head coach, as Mike Leach is now at Mississippi State. They welcome in Nick Rolovich. And um, I think with some pretty big lofty expectations for the offense, so I could see this one kind of being a shootout, um, but my instincts, if you want to call them that, my gut, I don't know why I said instincts, but my <laughs> gut tells me I could probably see the Huskies winning this one. Yeah, and I'm torn on this because I think Rovlich could come in and not run the same offense, but I think he could run kind of a similar, a similar style where a lot of those players that have already been in the program, it's not like a whole brand new thing necessarily. Um, I know there'll be changes, of course. Plus, you're breaking in a new quarterback and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of question marks. Um, it's just the kind of game that, like, if there was ever a year for the Cougars to finally beat the Huskies, like, this seems like that year. Especially if things aren't – like, if we've talked about, if they're sitting there at 7-4, and 8-3, and three, or whatever it is, 6-5, and five, any of those, like, they have to smell blood in the water and, and think, okay, this is the year because I just looked it up because I didn't know this off the top. They've won – the Huskies have won seven in a row dating back to 2013, which is a pretty long stretch for any team to beat any team that many times in a row. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'm going to take, I think the Cougars will win this. I'm going to go, I'm going to disagree and I'm going to, I'm going to take the Cougars in this one. Um, it's just the kind of game where even if they're having a bad season, you know, they're going to be playing, you know, that's going to be the one redeeming game of the season and it's the last game of the year and it's at home and, and stuff like that. Um, so I think it could be a fun game. I think it could be kind of a shootout again, you know, with, with the offensive talent, the, Hus the Huskies, they have a couple of really great offensive players. And then these Cougar receivers that just come out of nowhere and you're like, who's this guy? Oh, he has 90 catches and hundred yards this game or, or whatever. Nine, you know, he has a hundred yards and a touchdown this game or whatever. And it's like, okay. And they always have those guys. So 
I'll take the Cougars just for fun a little bit. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to see how, how that program up there, how that kind of goes with the new head coach as well. Definitely. Okay. So, um, that's what we're thinking on the Cougs and the Huskies matchup in the Apple Cup. Uh, just been keeping notes as we've been going here. I, I want to say that for our final season prediction for the Huskies, we're looking at right around six and six, seven and five, uh, kind of middle of the road for uh, Jimmy Lake's first season. They were eight and five last year. So not necessarily taking a step forward, but not so much a huge step back as well, which isn't really that bad for a coach's first season. Um, before we get out of here, Jacob, any, any final thoughts on the Huskies? Yeah, just what you were saying. I don't, if they go seven and five, I don't think that's a bad year. If they, if they lose the games they should and they beat the teams they should, and maybe those losses, they are competitive at least. I mean, when you're breaking in that much new into a program, it's always going to be difficult unless a couple guys just kind of hit out of nowhere. And they do. They have some pretty talented players that have yet to really see the field. So, I mean, we could be sitting here after that Michigan game and say, wow, we were, we were off about some of these predictions. If, if some of those guys do pop, but it's just – it's too many things to bank on that the OC is going to be, you know – good enough that the quarterback's going to get the job done, that the running back group's going to be good, that the, the defensive line group will, will have enough juice this year uh, and, and just stuff like that. There's just so, so many unknowns with them that they're all bound to not necessarily go perfect. It's just not going to happen next year. Um, but I, I mean, if they are eight and four, I think that'd be a pretty, pretty successful season. It'd be a lot to build off of because then you can go into the next season with, with Sermon in year two or whoever it may be. But yeah, that's that's uh, that's about it. All right, right on. Well, um, everyone, thanks for tuning in to the first episode of the uh, season preview that we're doing on YouTube. Make sure to give Jacob a follow on Twitter. He's a part of our Scoop Duck team. Jacob, what's your uh, what's your info? Just so we can we can give you a shout out here. Yeah, it's Jacob under dash Archer twelve on Twitter. Oh, sorry, I think our connection got got go bad for there for again. a second. Go it's for Jacob under dash Archer. 12 on Twitter. Uh, we write daily articles, Max and I. We, we get recruiting content, football content, basketball, anything, anything and everything Oregon. Um, you can find it. You can also check us out on scoopduck.com. Uh, we both have some free articles that are up and stuff if you want to if you want to get to know more. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Jacob, and we'll see you guys in the next episode.